wonder. A feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. When I was a young boy living here in Arizona, my grandparents used to visit from Illinois. They always came in the wintertime because they were brilliant people, all right? So they came out to visit. I remember one year my grandma, Stefan, said to us, she goes, kids, we're going to take you down to the airport, Sky Harbor Airport. We're going to sit on the edge of the runway, and we're going to watch the airplanes land. The key word I heard there was sit. And as a young boy, I'm like, this will be the most boring thing ever. And I'm sitting there. This is, this is back in the day when you could park by the runway. Remember those days, anybody? Yeah, you're like, what? How old are you, Pastor Dan? And well, the Wright brothers were flying for United at the time. So and some of you have no idea who the Wright brothers are. All right. And so I, we, I was sitting there watching the planes land. All of a sudden, I remember the first one that came down, and it got over our heads, and I could almost reach up and touch it. And the sound overwhelmed me. It was like, whoosh. And then it hit the runway. Ah, ah. I think that's how it sounded. And they landed the plane. As a young boy, I was just like, I can't believe this. This is so awesome. You're the best grandmother in the whole wide world. As I got older, I fell in love with this beautiful Italian girl, Nicole Marie Parati. How you doing, sweetie? How you doing? Oh, it's good to see you back there. All right. And I remember the first time she told me she loved me. Oh, pitter-patter. Heart was a pounding. It was just such a great moment, such wonder. She loved me. She loves me. And then we had three beautiful children, Joshua, Luke, and Abigail. And I remember when they first started to talk, one of their first words was, Dada. They said Dada before they said Mama. And I thought to myself, they love me more. It's incredible. And then Nicole said, no, scientifically proven, it's easier to say Dada than it is to say Mama. To which I said, whatever helps you sleep at night, sweetheart. Okay? <laughs> I remember one of some of Abby's first words when she first started saying, I love you. I'd, I kiss her goodnight. We say our prayers. I kiss her goodnight. And she'd go, I you, Daddy. I, come on, is that not the best? And I, you, daddy, and I would turn the light back on, look at her and go, and you are my favorite, don't tell the boys. All right, I, you too, good night. This Christmas, I want to remind us of a truth about God that brings great wonder. John the disciple, I think, was most impacted by this truth. He writes about it most passionately. John doesn't go into the details of the birth of Jesus in his gospel. He doesn't go into the where and the when and the how. John focuses on the why. John focuses on the motive behind why Jesus came, why he was born. John starts off his gospel in chapter 1 going all the way back to Jesus' timeless roots. In the beginning, John describes Jesus as full of life and full of light and full of grace and full of truth. And then as Jesus grows, becomes a man, enters into his ministry here on earth and starts calling his disciples, in John chapter 3, John records a story between Jesus and a, and a religious leader named Nicodemus. So in John chapter 3, verse 2, we hear this interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. Everybody say Nicodemus. It starts off in verse 2, it says this, he came to Jesus at night. Let's stop there. Didn't we all? I know I did. I came to Jesus when my life was dark and it lost all wonder. Nick was a religious leader. Religion had squelched the wonder of God right out of his heart. Jesus tells Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. And then this big discussion ensues about how can a man, when he's older, go back into his mother's womb and be born again? He's just not getting it. Jesus lays some deep spirit truth on Nicodemus. And then John records... The mo one of the most famous verses in the Bible, the reason, the motive behind why Jesus was born. I'll give you a hint. Again, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse... Good job, class. You're doing really good tonight, all right? Let's unpack this together. John 3, 16. Starts off, first three words, for God so... Let's stop right there. For God so what? For, for, for God was so frustrated, he was upset, he was annoyed, he had had enough... Have you ever just had enough of somebody? Maybe on your way to church tonight, so just look at me, don't look around, okay? You just had enough. So what's going on? What's going on with God? For God so, what does it go on to say? Loved. Yeah, and you need to understand, in Nick's mind, who God loved was a really, really, really big deal. Because he believed that God only loved the Jewish people. So this next statement was huge. It had to blow Nicodemus' mind. Verse 16 continues, for God so loved the the world. And, and Nicodemus had to be like, wait a minute, time out. You mean the whole world, like Romans and Greeks and even pagans and Gentiles? I mean, think about today. Like God loves Democrats and Republicans. Are you kidding me? Seriously? He even loves Cowboys fans. Really? <laughs> Cowboys fans? Let's get even worse. Raiders fans. I mean, how is it possible 
I know. How is it possible? I know even Raiders fans are like, I have no idea what's going on. I know how he does that. It's for some of us sitting here tonight, you've really wrestled with how will God actually love me? Dan, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the things that I've done. And so I, I walked in here tonight. Some of you are thinking, I walked in here tonight. I got an invitation from somebody, and I was a little bit anxious because how could I go into such a, a religious place considering the things I've done with my life? Well, you're not alone. Every person in this room has messed up. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get a witness? Can you raise your hand tonight? I messed up, all right? If you didn't raise your hand, you just lied. Welcome to, <laughs> welcome to the club. <laughs> you just joined us. It was awesome, wasn't it? You didn't know you were joining the club, but you did just then. All right, so... So we have good news for you tonight. See, God knows everything that I've ever done. He knows everything I've ever done. He knows everything I'm going to do, good, bad, and ugly. God, deeper than that, God knows everything I've ever said. Deeper than that, God knows everything I've ever thought. And he still loves me. He still wants to be with me. I know some thoughts I've had where I didn't like myself. He still loves me. I asked this a couple weekends ago. How many of you have friends? Anybody friends? It's still amazing to me, only half the room raises their hands. Like, let me ask you, how many of you wouldn't raise your hand no matter what I said? Would you just, would you, yeah, exactly. Come on. Let me tell you, let me ask you this. If your friends knew your every thought, they wouldn't be your friends anymore. God knows everything I've done, everything I've said, everything I've thought, and he still loves me. I believe the deepest heart question we have as human beings is this. Am I loved? Really, do, do I matter? Does anyone see me? Am I valuable? See, John wants us to get this this Christmas Eve. He wants us to know this deep in our heart. Here's the truth about God. God's not mad at us. God's in love with us. Listen to John's wonder in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. He says this, whoever does not love does not know God because why? God is love. Say it again. God is love. Tell your neighbor, God is love. It's his very nature. It's his very character. He is love. John spent three years walking the earth with Jesus. Jesus made it very clear. When you see me, Jesus said, you've seen the Father. I am God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And the best way that John could describe him, John said, here's the only way I could break it down for you. He is love. It goes on. Look at what God does with this love. So what did he do? Goes on, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he, he did what people who are in love do. People who are in love give. I remember when Nicole and I were first married. I think it was our second Christmas together. And I wanted to do something really nice for her, but I was broke as a joke. As T.D. Jakes would say, I was broke, busted, and disgusted. I, I had no money. And so I went to my Aunt Sandy and I said, Aunt Sandy, can you help me be creative? Can you help me? I don't, have, I don't have much, but can you help me? She was a Mary Kay rep. She said, how much money do you have budgeted for Christmas? <laughs> Anybody budget Christmas? Can you put those words together? All right. I go, Aunt Sandy, I budget for electricity. I budget for water and my mortgage. I got no budget. She says, let me ask you this. How much money can you scrape together? I said, about 100 bones, about 100 bucks. I said, 111 if I spend more time at the couch looking under the cushions. We can get up to maybe 111. She says, just give me what you got. And so she bought these 12 boxes, 12 days of Christmas. Started with a big one at the bottom, worked all the way up to the top with a little bitty box. And she put in each box a piece of Mary Kay product. It was such a powerful moment. She gave me these 12 card, index cards. She said, I want you to write 12 love notes to your wonderful bride. Put one in each box, and she's going to open them 12 days going into Christmas. I know, I know what you're thinking. That guy is so romantic. Yes, my Aunt Sandy is incredibly romantic, all right? <laughs> and so over the years, it's become Abby's role to help me set up these boxes. And we would set all the boxes up, and then Abby would take the top box where we had put all the love notes over the years. We'd collect them all in the top box. And she would open up the top box. She'd go over and sit down by the tree, and she would read all the notes. And she would pour over them. And she would read them over and over and over. And over the years, I've wondered, like, what was that? What was going through her mind? You know, Abby's 15 years old, going on about 35 at this point, all right? And she's a smart, brilliant, beautiful young girl. But she looks around a world of brokenness. She looks around a world and asks questions deep in her heart. 
Is there really such thing as committed love in this life? Will I ever really be loved? Will there ever be a boy who loves Jesus? Will he ever love me for a lifetime? Will I find somebody like that? And so this year, for the first time, we, we moved into a new house, and after 20-some years, those boxes have been so, so beat up over the years. But we had the top box, and I opened it up, and I got out the little cards, and I, I read them this year for the first time in a while, and I asked Nicole for permission, and she said, yes, I'm going to read you three of the cards. And I want to read these to you because it gave me an insight into what I read them this year through Abby's heart, through her mind, as a 15-year-old girl in a very broken world. The first card I want to read you has a lot to do with commitment, It says this, Nicole, I am always faithful to you. I will always be true to you and to you alone. You are all I need. You are all I want. I will love you always. Dan. But it's the next two cards that I want to share with you that I believe went deeper than just the commitment part. She looks around a world of airbrushed images, of digitally enhanced pictures of women who constantly tell our girls that they are not enough. And so I, I, I pulled these two cards out to read to you. Here's, here's the first one. Nicole, you are so beautiful to me. When I look at you, I say, wow, what an Italian beauty. Thank you for loving me in return. Love always, Dan. And this one, the last one. Nicole, I love your big brown eyes, your, your beautiful Italian face, your, your luscious lips. And I'm just going to stop right there. It's a married card. So. <laughs> so. That really is all that's on the card. My daughter was reading them. What do you think I am, a sicko? Come on, people. (laughs) Here's what Abby has heard her entire life. From the time she could understand words. You look just like your mom. Oh, it's, it's uncanny. You look exactly like your mom. So what did she hear? As a 15-year-old girl in an airbrush world, I love your beautiful face. You are so beautiful to me. See, it's not because I'm so good. I'm showing you like one highlight reel tonight, okay? I have a lot of other moments where I didn't do so well as a dad, okay? Just trust. I'll share that in January. But tonight, we're going to focus on a good one, okay? (laughs) She heard a father's heart. She saw a husband's love. And it went deep to her deepest questions. Am I beautiful? Do I have what it takes? Could anybody love me for a lifetime? And the answer is absolutely yes. In Christ, through Christ, his love, his power, this is possible. And God goes on. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, what did he give? What did he give? Boxes, love, no. What did he give? He gave his one and only son. He gave what was most precious to him. This proves that he is in love. God didn't just feel love for us. He showed love to us. And then a few years later, Jesus would show his ultimate love. He would be crucified on a Roman cross at the demand of Nicodemus' fellow religious leaders. And after Jesus' death, John records in John chapter 19, verses 38 and 39, a powerful scene. And I want to share this with you. This is right after Jesus dies on the cross. And this is what John records in chapter 19 of John's gospel. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for he feared the Jewish leaders. See, Nicodemus, Nick didn't come to Jesus at night just because of his soul condition. He came to Jesus at night because he was afraid of being excommunicated from his religion. He was afraid of being beaten for following a rogue rabbi. He was scared. It says, with Pilate's permission, he came and he took the body away. And then verse 39, one of my favorite scenes in the New Testament. Look what happens to Nicodemus. I love this. Joseph of Arimathea, he was accompanied by whom? Nicodemus, who earlier visited Jesus when? At night. And Nicodemus brought myrrh and aloes. Here's my big question this Christmas Eve. You ready? Big question. Lean in. Here it is. What changed for Nick at night? (laughs) That's a really bad joke right there. (laughs) But seriously, what changed for him? What went from being scared in the middle of the night, afraid of the religious leaders, to openly in the daylight, risking everything? I believe he saw Jesus die. 
I believe he heard Jesus from the cross say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he had never seen love like that before. That kind of love overwhelmed him. That kind of love engulfed him like a jet plane landing over a small child. And the awe and the wonder of that kind of love filled Nicodemus' heart so deep he risked everything and responded back in love to Jesus. And we see in John's wonder of this in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, this is what he said, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called, listen to this, children of God, and that is what we are. See, here's what I want for each and every one of us. This is what I want for my own life this year. This is what I want for my family's life and everybody listening online tonight. This is what I want for us. I want us to live in 2020 as if we were truly loved. Because when you wake up every day knowing you are truly loved by God, that changes everything. Everything, And this is going to be a year, probably more than any other year we've had in a long time, when we're going to need to know that we're loved because we are going to be called to love in ways we've never loved before. We're going to have, this is a presidential election year. It's going to be such a peaceful time. <laughs> Next Thanksgiving, Christmas, families are going to gather together and say, isn't it wonderful how harmonious our family is after this election? It's going to be a wild and crazy year. Don't get me wrong, it's going to be an amazing year. But the word maze is still in amazing. And it's not going to be easy, but we're going to love differently this year. We're going to live differently. We're going to give and be generous, and we're going to be creative and powerful and strong, and we're going to be confident. Why? Because we're going to know that we know that we are loved. We're going to be less offended this year. Can I get an amen up in here on Christmas Eve? We're going to be less offended. We're going to be more confident this year because we will know that we're loved by God. And when you know that you are loved, fear, insecurity, Anger begins to evaporate. Counselors have this interesting statement called the rejection cycle. It works this way. We fear being rejected, so we act rejectable. And guess what happens? It's not a trick question. We get rejected, which makes us fear rejection even more, which makes us act more rejectable. And guess what happens again? Seriously? You don't know. You get more rejected. And the cycle just keeps going. But when love comes in, when you're convinced and you know that you are loved, that anxiety, that fear of rejection begins to evaporate. You see, God loved us before we did anything lovable. He lavished his love on us and said, I want you to become my child, not just my creation, but by believing in me, trusting in my son, Jesus Christ, you will move from being my creation to my very own child. And he did that before we did anything deserving being loved. We didn't do a thing that was lovable. Matter of fact, the Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Abby and I were driving home. My daughter and I were driving home from church a couple weeks ago. And um, we were talking about school and she was sharing with me about college. And she's really excited. She's already got a couple of letters from colleges and she's just a sophomore. And, and uh, she does really good in school. She's got a, a major, it's like a serious GPA, um, which I have no box for, all right, and for my high school days. And so we were talking about that and we were really, I said, I'm so proud of you. And so she went back doing, to doing what she always does when she drives and when I'm with her. She's, she's the DJ. And uh, so she's firing up some Kanye, Jesus is King, you know, and she's got a little, you know, Harry Styles you know, to balance it out. And so... <laughs> We're driving along, and finally the Holy Spirit just, he touches my heart with something to say to my daughter. Again, highlight real moment. I'm not, I'm not a perfect father, but God put this in my heart. And he, I, I turned to Abby, and I said, sweetheart, turn, turn the music off for just a second. Turn Harry off for just a second. I said, um, I need you to know something. This is very important. I said, I need, you, I need you to turn those big brown eyes over here, and I need you to look at me. I said, if you don't get good grades from here forward, if you don't get into a college. I want you to know this deep in your heart. I said, hear me, hear me. This is God speaking through me. He wants you to know this. I will never stop loving you. My love for you is not based on your performance. You are my daughter. I am your father. And I will always love you. But please get, keep getting good grades. Just please, just <laughs> get, into, get a scholarship. If you could get a scholarship, that would be even better, okay? but I will never stop loving you. One of the greatest examples of a father's love for a child is a ministry called Team Hoyt. Uh, probably 15 years ago, I showed one of the first videos they ever put out. 
It's a father and son relationship that is so powerful. And I know that tonight we can mentally maybe assent to love and maybe think about God's love, but sometimes you need to see love in action for it to go beyond your head and down into your heart. And so they just recently put out a brand new video, just highlighting an anniversary video, highlighting the Hoyt family. And I wanted you to see it tonight because I know that for some of us, we've got to get past just up here and also live right here. Here's a father and son, Team Hoyt. believe with all my heart and convinced of this, that Christmas is God the Father's way of saying you are not alone. No matter how broken you may feel, I will come to you. I love you. I will not leave you an orphan. I will make you my very own child. I will come into the brokenness of your life and I will put you back together and together we will do amazing things the hope, that's the, that's the message, that's the wonder of 
Christmas. And for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Zach introduced me to a beautiful song a little while back called Here Comes Heaven. I want you to let the words of the song wash over you tonight. Let the, the images wash over your heart. I'll be back in just a moment to finish the service. There's a reason why John 3.16 is the most famous verse in the Bible. And the reason why I believe it's the ultimate Christmas verse. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And then here comes the rest. And whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The word believe here is very important. It's not just your conventionally assent to him or understand why we needed a savior and we couldn't fix our problems on our own. It's not, it's not about reasoning out your faith. Believe here has the idea to put the full weight of your life on, meaning to trust, to trust him with everything that you have. Let me ask you a quick question before we close tonight. Think about the person in your life that you trust the most. Get them in your mind. That you trust them the most. If there was something going on and you had a problem, you would go to that. You trust them. Let me ask you a question about that person. Why do you trust them? I would be willing to say, it's not just because they have maybe some money to help you or they have a lot of wisdom or they have a lot of strength or they're just a really good person. I would submit to you, you trust them because you are convinced that no one else loves you like they love you. For God so loved the world. You see, the reason I put my trust in Christ, here's the cool thing. He has all riches, all power, all wisdom, all knowledge. His presence is everywhere throughout the entire universe. Those are great reasons to go to him. But I go to him because of John's motive. No one loved me like him. I go to him because I'm convinced that when I go to him, I will rest my heart, my life, my future on his love. Oh, and then I get his wisdom and his power. All that just gets thrown in. And everybody said, bow your heads with me for just a moment. Let me ask you the most important question of your life. What are you going to do with Jesus' love? Are you going to receive it tonight? Are you going to put your life on that love tonight? Are you going to let him become your foundation? Or are you going to continue to try to do life in your own strength, your own power? You see, some of you are ready to make the greatest decision of your life. Some of you listening online right now, willing to put your life, to trust Jesus with your life, to trust his love, his power, his hope with your life. If that's you, on your screen, you're going to see a hand, an icon of a hand that's coming up. Would you click that in just a moment? I want to invite you to pray with the rest of us here in the auditorium. For the rest of us sitting here tonight, if you're in a place where you're ready to say yes to Jesus, where you need his love and you need his hope, and you want to surrender and commit your life to him, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make. Maybe for some of you, tonight's a first-time decision, the first time you've ever made this decision. For others sitting here tonight, maybe it's more of a rededication. Maybe years ago, maybe even at a Christmas Eve service, you asked Christ to come into your life. You committed your life to him. But man, if we could have a real conversation tonight, you would tell me, I am so far from where I was then. I've been doing my own thing, going my own way. Good news, you're not here by chance. Jesus wanted you here to slow you down long enough to remind you he has never stopped loving you and to call your heart back home to him. So if that's you sitting here tonight, maybe for the first time, or tonight's a rededication of your life to Christ. What we do in this safe place is we're ready to make that decision. We raise our hand high. When you raise your hand high, you're saying, that's me and I need Christ. So if that's you, without hesitation this Christmas Eve, would you just raise your hand up right now? Just say, I need Christ. Yes, absolutely. Anyone else? Just keep raising. Yes, and yes, and yes. Come on, who else tonight? I need Christ. That's fantastic. Yes. All of you with your hands raised, and everybody online, to click that button. Go ahead and put them down right now. And pray this in your heart. God hears you. Say this with me. Lord Jesus, right now in this moment, I commit my life to you. Oh, Jesus, I trust you with my life. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. You know what it is. I give it to you right now. No more games. I admit that I've been wrong. And I give it to you. And I thank you for your forgiveness. Say this. It's so important. Jesus, fill me with your presence. Fill me with your strength. Fill me with your hope and your love and your joy and your peace. I need you, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's give God a huge hand tonight. That's fantastic. Fantastic.